Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first, once again, it's my great pleasure to uh, thank Hans and Gulchen for their wonderful hospitality. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Jay for herding us cats together uh, on so many occasions. And uh, I've, I think this is my, m might be my ninth or tenth uh, talk. So by now, I think I must be uh, repeating myself. Um, but I take consolation in the great epistemological principle enunciated by the bellman in uh, Lewis Carroll's Hunting of the Snark. Uh, snark. Uh, what I say three times is true. Um, well, my theme uh, uh, this year departs slightly, I'm afraid, from the advertised one, but it's still quite close to it and indeed touches on it, so I hope you won't ask for your money back afterwards. I'm going to speak of the psychology of rights, uh, especially the so-called rights to tangible benefits and to uh, protection from psychological harm or distress. And these days, of course, harm and distress are uh, the same thing. On the very day on which I started to uh, uh, think about this talk, I happened to notice a sign on an orthophonist's office in France to the effect that good hearing is a right. So if you can't hear me, your rights are being infringed. Um, and this was uh, on the day which, on, on which uh, Pope Francis declared that access to clean water was a human right. And on that day also I read an article about the right uh, to assisted suicide. And a young American I, I uh, read on that day uh, was suing an employer uh, 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 because the employer had infringed his rights by demanding that he attend Bible study as a, as a condition of his employment. And then yesterday, actually, or maybe the day before, I was reading that in Berlin, a group of uh, young people is claiming that there is a right to a home in the center of Berlin, uh, which seemed to me to, uh, uh, to suggest that it will soon become rather crowded. Now, I don't think any of this is at all exceptional. On the contrary, we are now surrounded by a talk of rights, uh, as surrounded by it as we are by commercial advertising. And I therefore thought it would be worth considering the effect that the very concept of rights has on people's minds, on our culture, and also on our politics. And I think, I personally think this effect is almost entirely baleful, bad. Well, let's examine briefly the examples I've given from the day on which I started to think about uh, this talk. First, the right to good hearing. Uh, this surely suggests that if I go deaf, my rights have somehow been infringed or abrogated. But by whom? By what agency? It's true that in some cases of deafness, uh, I may have been subjected to noise against my uh, will. For example, uh, uh, rock music in shops. Um, or I may have caused it myself by uh, using uh, personal stereos, which I uh, play too loud. But surely I cannot have infringed my own rights. Besides, of course, there are many causes of deafness uh, which, whose causes are unknown. We don't, un we don't know uh, what the causes are. Does a tumor or otosclerosis represent an attack on anyone's rights. Well, you might say the orthophonist was only just advertising. He was only advertising his wares. He was at most being rhetorical. He didn't intend to be taken seriously. Well, this is quite possible. But the fact remains that his choice of language was significant, since it was designed to attract people. However, rhetoric uh, even advertising rhetoric is often taken seriously. And the fact that once something has been, and the fact is that once something has been declared a right to be a right, 
it enters people's mind on a kind of completely different metaphysical uh, sphere. It goes into metaphysical orbit, as it were, which severs it uh, completely from the world of empirical fact or possibility. Thus, the orthophonist did not say what was true, namely, if you have hearing loss, I may or may not be able to help you, which isn't a very inspiring, uh, uh, inspiring truth. But rather, he suggested what was false, namely that hearing loss is never a natural or irrecoverable phenomenon. Hearing loss therefore becomes abnormal and an assault on persons' rights, with the resultant uh, destruction of equanimity, resilience, fortitude, or understanding of the tragic dimension of life. Well, rights spread rather like potassium permanganate, uh, crystal spread in a beaker of water. For example, in the run-up to the turn of the millennium, the World Health Organization used a slogan, Health for All, by the year 2000. Note that it did not say health care for all uh, by the year 2000, but health itself. Health care for all is at least an attainable goal, and in a sense one that has actually already been attained, insofar as there are very few places in the world where people live entirely without it, though in many places, of course, it may be of low quality. The fact that a goal is attainable, however, does not mean that it is a right, although the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of uh, 1948 says that health, health care is a human right, as is health. Everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including medical care. These are, this is part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Since the WHO's definition of health is that it is not merely the absence of disease, but the pres positive presence of complete, complete physical, social, and psychological well-being, hands up the healthy in this room. <laughs> If you're healthy, I'm afraid you're mistaken, <laughs> if you think you're healthy. And since health is a right, it follows that any derogation, whatever, from well-being is an infringement of that right. We have moved, in a few simple words, from the right to the pursuit of happiness to the right to happiness itself. Again, you say that doesn't really matter because uh, no one reads the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the sermons uh, of the World Health Organization anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But I would remind you something. I hesitate to quote uh, uh, Keynes in this audience, but he did say something of some importance. The ideas of economists, and this is a famous passage, of course, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. In other words, ideas are like rumors, and like rumors, they spread, and of course, they influence both belief and ultimately behavior, if you believe that behavior is influenced by belief, which I do. A few years ago, I was asked by a magazine to review seven memoirs of illness. This is a new genre. And in fact, there are now university courses in English departments uh, devoted entirely to illness literature. Um, and of course, these, these um, uh, memoirs were all written by educated middle-class people, because only educated middle-class people are self-important enough uh, to write such memoirs. And. Uh, <clears throat> In several of them, there was an undercurrent of querulousness. Well, in fact, most of them. 
After all, the persons in question had always, they'd always gone jogging. Uh, they'd eaten healthily according to the latest doctrine of what eating healthily is. Uh, they'd never used glyphosate in their gardens, and so on and so forth. And yet here they were, they were still ill. And uh, they wrote as if their rights had been infringed because they'd stuck to the rules of, of uh, being healthy, sometimes at considerable cost to themselves. They felt that an injustice, had been, by falling ill, they had suffered an injustice. And of course, the search was on for the person whom they could sue. Uh, the tendency of rights to enter a different metaphysical sphere is illustrated in uh, the following case. There was a male nurse in my hospital who was an intelligent and a very nice young man who did his work very well. But as is commonly the case in England now, he had natural bad taste and he, <laughs> and he put earrings in his ear, not just one, but a whole row of them like this. And unfortunately, this had a rather unfortunate or unsettling effect on old ladies who recovered from delirium. Um, and they returned to delirium as being preferable. <laughs> Actually, the difference between delirium and reality now is rather small, but anyway. The hospital management uh, told him he had to remove the earrings. Um, but he said he had a right to put earrings in his ear. What he couldn't grasp, and what one often sees in this, this kind of situation, is that he was not being denied the right to wear his earrings. He was being denied the right to wear his earrings and work as a nurse in the hospital. As far as he was concerned, if he had a right to wear his earrings, he had a right to do them in all circumstances whatsoever. Otherwise, the right would not have been a right. And he had the right. Rights are, by definition, inalienable. Thus, they make people uncompromising. In the prison in which I worked, I met two men accused of trying to murder their neighbors in flats in which they lived. And this was because their neighbors played their music very loudly in the small hours of the morning. And let me tell you, it is terrible. The, these buildings actually shake with the m music. And they, the neighbors refused to moderate the volume of the music they were playing. And they said, uh, and they enforced this with baseball bats. Uh, we don't play baseball in England, but where there are many baseball bats. <laughs> Uh, they said that they had uh, a right to play their music, and that, for them, was the end of the matter. Three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, playing their music as loud as they liked, preventing a hundred people from being able to sleep, that was of no account. Well, I asked a young patient of mine, a 17-year-old girl, what she wanted to do in her life, and she said she wanted to be a lawyer, so I said, I asked her what branch of law attracted her. And uh, an expression came over her as if she were just about to declare that she had a religious vocation. This is what <laughs> would have been the case 50, 60 years ago. She said, I want to do human rights. And uh, of course, human rights are much more lucrative than religious vocations, but I didn't say that. I said, oh yes, that's very interesting. I said, tell me, where do human rights come from? And what do you mean, she asked me. And I, well, I said, there seem to be a lot of them about these days. <laughs> uh, why, why is that? Uh, I mean, how are human rights found? And were they always there, like America, waiting to be discovered by Columbus? Uh, or do we make them up as we go along? Well, she said, you can't ask that. And she was horrified. And perhaps it was rather unfair. She was only 17. But the fact is that she had absorbed the notion of rights, probably of many such rights, quite unthinkingly 
without any possible questioning. It's part, just part of the zeitgeist. Well, let me now come to uh, Pope Francis's suggestion that clean or potable water is a human uh, right. Potable water is, of course, something tangible, and it must be uh, produced. Uh, it doesn't come, at least in modern conditions, just by itself. If everyone has the right to consume it, who has the corresponding duty to provide it? The neighbors, the village, the town, the district, the country, the whole world? The corresponding duty to the right is something to something tangible always involves the coercion of somebody, uh, even where that person is willing to be uh, coerced. When someone claims uh, the right to assisted suicide, he's also claiming uh, that someone has the duty to assist him. Recently, in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was an article claiming that once society or the medical profession has decided that a certain kind of conduct is ethical, the individual doctor has no right to decline himself in accord with that ethical uh, principle. In other words, it is foreseeable that at some time a doctor could be held uh, to be acting unethically in refusing to kill his patient on the grounds that his patient had a right to assisted suicide. And incidentally, why should only the dying have assisted suicide? Why should only the dying have a good death? Again, the psychological fact is that talk of rights tends to trans truncate the moral imagination. And I think it's a fair bet that if I were to say to say to young school leavers or university students that people have no right to clean water, many of them would uh, reply, so you think it's all right for people uh, to have to drink uh, dirty, uh, disease-ridden water. And certainly when I've uh, suggested to medical students that people have no right to medical care, most of them have said, so you think it's all right for people just to die in the street? As if there were nothing between the universal right to health care and the Black Death. And when in, our, uh, in answer I've asked them to think of some reason why people should not just be left to die in the street, other than that they had a right to health care, they have been unable to think of any. That is to say, the idea of rights seems to drive all other moral considerations from people's minds. Well, let's now consider the case of the man who believed that his right not to be discriminated against on grounds of religion were infringed by the company that sacked him because he would not attend Bible study sessions. Now, I confess that I find the company's insistence odious, odiously unctuous, um, worthy of uh, satire by Dickens, and it disgusts me. On the other hand, it seems to me that the company has a right, uh, the natural right, if I may so put it, to demand such a condition of its workers, provided that it is privately owned and that it is not in the position of a, mo uh, of a, 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 a monopoly employer. That is to say that the person who refuses to attend Bible classes has a choice of employment elsewhere. Whether the right of a private company to discriminate between potential employers on grounds seemingly unrelated to the ostensible purpose of the company, though of course the owners might claim that their ultimate purpose was the spreading of the word of Jesus. That was the ultimate purpose of their company. Whether that should prevail over a man's right not to be badgered into religious study is a question that inevitably generates conflict in the present context. The debate over abortion in the United States pits two seemingly incompatible rights, one against the other, the right to life of the fertilized ovum against the right of a woman to do whatever she likes uh, with her body. And all the two sides can do is to shout at one another um, that my right is more fundamental than your right and therefore should prevail. 
And the debate uh, doesn't get any further than that. And this is after many, many years. Where rights conflict, as inevitably they will, as more and more of them are granted, uh, floating, as I say, into a completely different metaphysical sphere as soon as they are granted, uh, they have to be adjudicated. This, of course, confers immense powers on the state or whatever organization to interfere in the smallest change of life. It extends the reach of administration and makes the law the arbiter of all that is permissible or impermissible. And this is illustrated by an expression now used in self-justification of unpleasant uh, behavior in Britain. There is no law against it. There's no law against it. In other words, what is legally permissible is permissible in every other sense because what the law permits is a right. So you can do what you have a right to do and no other moral consideration um, needs to be taken into account and often by people is not taken into account. Now I come now to the point in which uh, my talk on the psychology of rights touches on my advertised subject, the subject of uh, mul uh, psychology of multiculturalism. Rights, having first encouraged a kind of egotistical individualism in the population, individualism without much individuality, I must, I must say, are now widely believed also to inhere in or belong to groups, so long as those groups are perceived to be in some way handicapped, oppressed, or victimized uh, now or at some time in the past. Not only individuals, but groups then are believed uh, to have rights. Again, these rights often conflict, but this is all to the advantage of a bureaucratic apparatus of adjudicators. Among the group rights claimed in practice by the leaders of groups, who are themselves almost always self-appointed, is the right not to be offended, which of course includes the right to decide what is offensive. There is no need for an objective correlative. Uh, you are offended, of course, if you say you are. But just as the appetite grows with eating, so does taking offense increase with having taken previous offense. And since taking offense gives one the right to, to, to decree what may or may not be said, being offended actually becomes an exercise in power. Incidentally, the politicization of supposed group rights increasingly puts social pressure on individuals who belong to that group to accept, adopt, or at least not demur from the supposed collective opinion of that group. It goes without saying that the more groups that claim the right not to be offended, on the grounds that either in the past or the present they have been persecuted or maltreated, the narrower and narrower the range of opinion that can be expressed. Which groups are to be protected from offense becomes itself a matter of conflict. But the fact is that the majority of the population by now belongs to one minority or another that claims the right to decide what is offensive an atmosphere not exactly of terror, that would be a, a bit of an exaggeration, but at least of fear and anxiety that I think is now general has resulted. People are afraid to speak their mind. A journalistic colleague of mine in an American publication for which I write, and who herself always writes in a measured way and never expresses an opinion that is absurd or indefensible, has now to live under police protection because she has published work that offends certain groups. Not long ago, the Irish uh, television service asked me to give my opinion on the sudden rise in the Western world of the question of transsexualism, uh, now incidentally called transgenderism, a change of vocabulary which I find significant and far from innocent. The producers of the program wanted to find someone to say that the rise uh, to prominence of this question or problem was something other than a great social advance. 
and it was not a great uh, advance for the freedom of mankind. But they were having great difficulty not with finding anyone who was of that opinion, but finding anyone who was willing to express that opinion in public. In other words, a very small group had managed within a matter of a few years, I don't know when this question first came to prominence, it's a bit difficult to say, but it, it's certainly not more than five years ago, uh, it, it, this group has managed to prohibit debate on a subject that is, at the very least, debatable doing so by claiming the right not to be offended. In no time at all, practically, their right has enabled them and their supporters to impose what is a very strange uh, view on the world that only a tiny minority of the population has. In a Dutch university recently, where I gave a talk, uh, there were um, notices on the lavatories enjoining users not to embarrass transsexuals, claiming that we can do better. And debate has been so effectively silenced uh, that there is no debate even in medical circles. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, published in 2013, gave the prevalence of transsexualism as about 0.0035% of the population. That is to say, approximately one person in 30,000. Five years later, uh, so four years later, I apologize, in 2017, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine gave the prevalence as 0.6%. That is to say, an increase in only four years of 17,000%. Um, what was, I found most significant about this was that it passed without notice or commentary. And to, even to have commented on it, or, or to have noticed it, would have caused offence. And, uh, and people are afraid. Increasingly, groups or their supposed leaders claim the right to be represented in demographic proportion um, in the more prestigious or lucrative positions in society. As far as I know, no pressure group has ever been formed for the right to sweep the roads. If all groups are not represented um, proportionately, in the higher reaches of society, there can be only one explanation of it, that is to say discrimination. And to discriminate is an attack on the rights of the discriminated against, and can only be repelled by a resort, uh, can only be altered or improved by a resort to a vast political, legal, and administrative apparatus to ensure that supposed justice is done. And I. I'm not sure whether I told you about this some years ago, one year ago, two years ago, but in the hospital in which I worked, they sent a questionnaire to the employees asking them to state their sexual orientation. Now, there were only six choices. <laughs> and I said that really they ought to, uh, this shows a very limited uh, uh, sexual imagination and that they ought to read uh, Kraft Ebbing and uh, Psychopathia Sexualis um, and races I think there were 17 races uh, they omitted the Melanesians and um, and religions there were quite a few but all together and the, the reason for this uh, inquiry was so that they could uh, pay us uh, correctly that is to say proportionately to the proportion of people in the various categories. Well, whatever one might think of the doctrine of human uh, rights, I think it fair to say it was intended to, uh, to expand the scope of human freedom, and, in, in, and actually did so. But in our hands, I mean in the hands of the intellectuals of our time, the doctrine of rights has been uh, increasingly used to assume power and uh, limit freedom. So in summary, I would say that the notion of rights has the following effects. It increases egotism and an insensate individualism. It increases self-esteem 
at the expense of self-respect. People have a right to self-esteem. It promotes a psychological dialectic between resentment and ingratitude, since what is received as of right is not appreciated since it is received as of right, and what is actually received is actually usually uh, less than, the in than what people are, think that they are entitled to, thus becoming a cause of resentment. It induces a permanent state of querulous vigilance insofar as it is, it feared, it is feared that one's rights uh, are being constantly infringed. It causes perpetual conflict between different people's rights that are not compatible, an incompatibility uh, that can only be resolved either by legal action, that's in the best of cases, or in some cases, violence. And insofar as rights are uh, inalienable, 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 they trump, uh, if I may use that word, all other moral considerations. And uh, while promoting personal egotism, they also promote uh, group rights, which entails the balkanization of society and the promotion of the idea that the division of the spoils is the main aim of political and economic uh, life. The slices and crumbs of the economic cake uh, to be assigned according to some abstract but self interested uh, plan. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, the consequences of the notion of rights uh, uh, for human freedom uh, are, are therefore obvious. Thank you very much.